In this month's economic update, Kaplan Professional Education's Trevor Trahan speaks to an industry economist about the short-term domestic and global economic outlook. Welcome to Kaplan Professional Education's monthly economic update. I'm Trevor Trahan and this month we're speaking to HSBC's Paul Bloxham. Thanks for joining us today, Paul. No problem. Treasurer Chris Bowden has said productivity is key to the Australian economy moving to non-resource growth. How can this be achieved? Look, Australia's economy needs to rebalance. Growth has been very uneven in recent years. What we've seen is a very large run-up in mining investment and that's been the key contributor to GDP growth in Australia. In fact, last year in 2012, it was over half of all GDP growth. So as the mining investment story slows down, and indeed it is slowing down, we need the other parts of the economy to start to pick up and take over as drivers of growth. We think that's going to happen. We think low interest rates are starting to support that already and a lower exchange rate are also starting to motivate it. But the point I think the Treasurer was making is that for that to happen, you need the economy to be fairly flexible. It needs to be able to adjust fairly smoothly from a mining investment-led story to, a, to growth led by the other parts of the economy. And that only really happens if the economy is fairly flexible. What we need is to be putting in place more arrangements to make the labour market more flexible, to make the regulatory environment more flexible, to deal with the fact that the tax system is probably in need of reform as well. And doing those things would help uh, the pace of adjustment uh, from a mining-led story to a non-mining-led story. Of course, the challenge is that it would have been quite helpful if a lot of these reforms were already in progress. That we'd already put them in place as this challenge for Australia in terms of rebalancing from mining-led growth to non-mining-led growth is, is now upon us. It, it would be better if the economy was already uh, reforming and, and the structure of the economy was in, in better, better shape to deal with this, this changing the sh change in the shape of growth. Australia's labour market continued to loosen in June with the unemployment rate edging up to 5.7%. Is this a cause for concern? It certainly is a cause for concern and it's something that economists and policymakers alike are watching very carefully. The labour market has been loosening. The unemployment rate was sitting around five and a quarter percent for most of last year and it's been loosening since the tail end of last year and, and into the first half of, of, of 2013 at 5.75%. It's still fairly low relative to history. It's fairly close to full employment. But if it continued to rise, that would be something to start to worry about. And indeed, that's something that the RBA is trying to offset by having cut interest rates. Uh, and of course, that the, the Aussie dollar falling is also going to help to provide a bit of support for growth to try and offset that. But the key point is the labour market is, is loose. It is loosening. Uh, in, in loosening, the other thing, of course, it's delivering is, is uh, lower wages growth. So the looser labour market means that there is lower wages growth, which should keep inflation contained. That should allow the RBA with room to be able to cut interest rates further if they need to support growth. So the, the, higher, the higher unemployment rate is, is one of the reasons why you might expect that the RBA could cut interest rates a bit further. Uh, but at the same time, of course, it's also a signal that the Australian economy is growing at a bit below trend. We, we have in mind the unemployment rate might start to steady at about the sort of level that it is out to the second half of this year. And we have in mind that through next year, it, it will actually start to decline as we think interest rates will get some more grip, uh, growth will lift and growth will rebalance as interest rates are low and the exchange rate has come down. Exports from the Eurozone slumped in May, as did imports. How can this contraction be nullified? Look, the European economy is not in great shape at the moment. It's still in recession. Uh, we have in mind that for the year as a whole this year, the European economy will continue to contract. And if you're lucky, you might get some very sm small, uh, a very small growth rate uh, next, next year. We might get a, sm a small pickup. But the point is the European economy is really not in great shape. The way I like to think about this, though, is last year, uh, 2012, the big event uh, in Europe, the, the reason why we were all focused on Europe was the possibility that we might see a financial collapse. Uh, Europe didn't collapse. Uh, in fact, the ECB stepped up to the plate, provided liquidity, and, and bond markets now think that the euro will stay together. So the Euro European story was very important for the global economy, mostly because of the risk that it might have collapsed last year. We're, we're now in a situation where the European economy is stable, albeit it's still weak and still shrinking this year uh, but the fact that it's stable is what's most important for the rest of the world the fact that we're not likely to see the euro come apart and indeed that's our central case in terms of the trade data one of the things that had been holding up the European economy in, in recent times had been German exports to China and of course a slowdown in China is starting to now get reflected in, in weaker trade from Europe so the, the, the Asia story is feeding through to, to, to providing less support for European growth. But, but overall, look, we have in mind the global story is about the US and China, less so about Europe at the moment. 
As the US economy slowly rebuilds, what will emerge as the main lessons learned from the GFC? Look, I think the main lesson from the GFC is financial crises happen, and they happen to developed economies as well. Of course, before the global financial crisis, uh, really most, most economists were still looking at the Asian financial crisis and the Russian financial crisis and the tequila crisis as events that really could only happen in the emerging world, in, in developing countries. And what this uh, event has taught us is that actually it can happen everywhere and it can happen anywhere. I think one of the other key lessons of course is that a key driver of these financial crises and, and a key driver of the extent to which they really do damage is how much leverage there is in a financial system. So it's not just about asset prices and the fact that asset prices can go up and then come down too much and of course do damage but it's the leverage that really does the damage. The damage in the US was done because a whole lot of people had taken, had borrowed and, and leveraged into those asset prices and when of course those asset prices started to come down they couldn't afford to continue to service it so there was a significant amount of debt that then had ramifications for the rest of the economy that flowed through to the rest of the economy so I think I think those are the, to the, the two key lessons one financial crises happen and they can happen anywhere including the developed world and two one of the key things to keep an eye on to watch very carefully is how much leverage is being taken in, uh, taken on into the financial system because that can be the bit that does a significant amount of damage when asset prices fall. How is the proclaimed end of the Chinese resources investment boom going to affect the rest of Asia? Well, China has a, a big effect on the rest of Asia. Uh, it's the major trading partner, it's the biggest economy in the region. Uh, the fact that the Chinese economy is slowing down this year, and indeed it is slowing down, uh, is, is having a, a, an effect on the trading, its major trading partners, which are mostly in Asia. Korea's growth is slowing, Hong Kong's growth is slowing, it's had an imp having an impact on Taiwan. Of course it's having a, a, an impact on Australia as well, uh, importantly, because we're a large commodity producer, we've had a very large run-up in commodity prices and those commodity prices have started to come down over the past 18 months because China's growth is slowing down. So it has some pretty big ramifications. The Chinese economy is adjusting. It's, it's uh, adjusting to a high level of investment that's been going on uh, and that investment over time will need to fall as a share of the Chinese economy and that's in particular going to have ramifications for big commodity producers like Australia. Now whether that transition happens smoothly or uh, is, is less smooth is, is the key question. We have in mind that China, although it's done a lot of investment, still has a fair bit of investment yet to do. Its urbanisation rate is still only 52%. The urbanisation rate in the US is more like 75%. There's a lot of people still that need to move and, and will move from the countryside to the cities. And when they do that, they'll need infrastructure, they'll need housing. So although we expect that over the medium term investment is going to slow down in its pace, there's still a lot more investment yet to do. So we're, we're still optimistic that the Chinese growth story will continue. We have in mind growth this year will be 7.4% and a similar rate of growth next year uh, before the Chinese economy uh, shows some more signs of slowing further out. Thanks for your time today, Paul. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of the August PD sessions. Thanks for watching. If you have any feedback or questions, please drop us a line at pdcontent at kaplan.edu.au. I'm Ron Wilson. See you again next time.